I think that all the ways in which we have allowed women, especially young women, greater autonomy and control over their life choices, there has been a negative consequence for those same women, I think, when they become mothers, because it's the same forces that give you more autonomy as an individual, weaken the social ties that are very they're important for families and for mothers. Would you like to know more? Hello, everyone. I'm really excited because after listening to Sarah Hader on podcasts for months, maybe years at this point, she is here on our podcast and we're so excited to have her on. If you don't know her, she is on Substack. Her Substack is called Hold That Thought. You can find it at newsletter.sarahader.com. That's H-A-I-D-E-R. And on Twitter, she's Sarah the Hader as an H-A-I-D-E-R, which is a great, it's a great name, Sarah. <laughs> uh, she you. also does with Megan Dom, who we also love, uh, a podcast called A Special Place in Hell, which is very fun. Your banter is fantastic. So we're very glad to have you here bantering with us. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you for having me. I'm and so let's excited. jump yeah. right into the tweet that got us connected because I think <laughs> it's good framing for the topic of this show. Let's go. All yeah. right, let's do it. Do you want to read it, Simone? Or do you yeah, want- I'll read it. The other the other day, Sarah asked if there were any groups slash resources out there, for lack of a better word, that offer traditional parenting, but with a secular or rationalist approach. And someone from probably like a follower of this podcast followed us and followed Sarah and connected us saying, hey, you should probably talk with someone and Malcolm. Let's start with whatever (laughs) motivated this tweet. Yeah, what made you decide to tweet that? What do you think in there? Yeah, it's been in the works for a while, but I am a a new mom, new-ish. I have a toddler. So I, I was looking to connect with other parents. I have been for some time now that it's like a play date age. Mm. And just lo- thinking about how to think about parenting, like what are the models that make sense? Now we're, we're at a point where we're thinking about school, preschool, homeschool, mm-hmm. Montessori. Oh so the, yeah. all these big questions are coming up. And I'm not the kind of person who trusts establishment, like the kind of normie options make me nervous sometimes. And I actually have good reason to feel that way about our education system. I didn't love it when I was going through it. I went to public school. I don't know if you guys did as well, but same. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, so public school. Mm-hmm. Terrible experience. I just can't the prison metaphor is a good one but i think it really killed my love of learning which i had very naturally it's the same contractors <laughs> actually in the bay area where i went to school the the same architectural firm did design most of the jails and the high school so i think they had the same parent company that was creating the cafeteria food <laughs> yeah. oh yeah life. no i imagine yeah. that's true in a lot of areas because it makes sense if you're winning government contracts anyway yeah, and yeah, it's, yeah. it's a school to pipeline ecosystem in a lot right. of these districts right you know, they, they're right. for one and the other yeah. Um, uh, luckily, I was not in one of those places, but I was definitely in a like testing, get good grades and compete in, incessantly, have like 10 hours of homework a night mm-hmm. school environment. It was not amazing. Not I was thinking about that with my son as well. And my background is actually in new atheism, which we were touching on a little bit. When yeah, we were touching on before this. <laughs> so for context for our viewers, this is, I think, germane for the topic of this podcast, somebody who rose to fame and the new atheist community. Simone and I really rose, like we were mostly affiliated with the EA rationalist, less Mm. wrong community before this. So obviously a bit of a different community, but very aligned culturally speaking. Definitely big areas of overlap for sure. Yeah. And the pronatalist movement in many ways within those communities represents a group that's, hey, we threw out a lot of stuff that maybe we shouldn't have thrown out. And it's hard to find people willing to engage with any aspect of the traditionalist idea. Like we often use the term neo-trad to mean, when, when I'm explaining it to reporters, I'm like, what it means is we look through various older traditions for social technology that we can re-implement and that still makes sense within our social and, and, and technological context right now. And a lot of people, they think when you're looking to the past for social technology, they mean, oh, so you're looking to just the 1950s. It's, no, like there's a lot of cultures in the past. I can look to ancient Athens. I can look to things that was common in Rome. I can look to things that was practiced in Egypt in various time periods. There are lots of social technologies that have evolved and can be re-screwed together that aren't just remove boundaries. Another thing that I was talking to somebody about recently that really colored this idea for me is for a long time, 
I'm actually speaking to a reporter at The Economist about this today. Technology, like, like societal progress has been tearing down fences and we didn't know why they were there. It's been very much, okay, there's this random rule here. Let's get rid of it. And up until today, we're now finally at a part where we have torn out so much of the base infrastructure that people are now realizing, oh, a lot of that infrastructure had a purpose and we get the opportunity to, we can either rebuild things exactly the way it used to be, or we can intentionally build the social infrastructure to really optimize it mm -hmm. uh, going into the future in a way that humanity never really has, which is really interesting to me. But anyway, yeah, just some context there. Yeah, yeah. So those could be, I've always been like rationalist curious, like I've always been like poking around in the blogs and not participating, but lurking. So I'm familiar, just broadly speaking, with some of the kind of movements and tendencies and values of like the rationalist sphere. And I definitely feel that that I align with that in a personality sense. It's harder when, when we get to policies that it can get trickier there because then that requires us to have the same facts on hand. So it, I don't know how much maybe we'll fork a little bit when it comes to that. But I definitely I like that approach, the kind of optimistic yet grounded in like a real reality. Let's engineer something like uh, I, I like that. Um, and I wanted to be able to talk to people who could, I, I, I like the way you, you put it, Malcolm. I, I like that you put, uh, that you can look back into the past as also, also something that we can look towards. Not just, we don't just have to come up with new ideas, but mm -hmm. we can look back and think about the wisdom of our forefathers or whatever but that's a weird word isn't it wisdom because i don't know if they were knew what they were doing but nevertheless it came together in a useful way for them and i i've come around to appreciating that as well i think a lot of people have walked that path in the past like 10 years or so in the atheist like new atheist mm -hmm. kind of community not so much like there there definitely was um, a big woke woke pilling that happened and in, in like atheism i don't know how you guys feel about that i feel like i know but it, it seems like the parts of it that survived actually became like anti-feminist channels and stuff like that it's like dedicated skeptics of whatever the dominant cultural group is and it, and i think that we see I want to say they're true colors, but what they are, and I suspect this is a genetic proclivity that is somewhat hard coded in some people mm -hmm. that they get off most on just criticizing the dominant culture in our society and the dominant cultural perception from me growing up transitioned from theocratic perception of the dominant culture, which is what I believed was the dominant culture when I was a kid. And I, I think it was accurate to a woke theology which is it gives them something new to criticize and yeah mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah I, I, maybe that maybe that there's definitely something to that about the public figures because certainly if you get popular in the new atheism movement you are known to be like this big critic of religion and religious values and i don't think the average atheist necessarily is that way even if they like lurk around in the communities they're not necessarily that way so there's a misrepresentation of the kinds of person who rises to the top in that space I tried not to be too much that way. I was trying more to fight for the right to criticize religion because I come from a Muslim background. In many Muslim majority countries, there's like nothing resembling freedom of speech or religion. And that sort of carries over into Muslim majority or just Muslim communities here in Western context as well, because there's so many of them for multiple reasons end up becoming very isolated. And so you have this like mini nation and there's a, I think of a, 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 a culture that is not open to dissent at, at all. So that's the kind of thing that I was talking about. And I found that it was really hard to talk about Islam openly because there were some things you're not supposed to say. And that was one of the things you're not supposed to say. And so that was my entryway into pushing back against the normal dominant like polit political paradigm. And my instinct, because I came in from that background, was to look away from religion when I'm looking, or even religious communities or anything resembling religious communities or traditional communities or anything like that. Like it was just, I, I don't think that I'm a person that's easy to bias. Nevertheless, this was my social context. This is everybody I knew. And this is still mm. many of the people I know. So traditional is a bad word. In the way religion is a bad word, it's it's 
the way that people think about it is definitely tied strongly with women's disempowerment all these like social ills that yeah. now we can talk about in a kind of a different way but it's impossible to move that conversation forward in some circles so i was when i was tweeting that i was actually wanting something else i don't want to uh, i don't want to be a part of the atheist parenting communities i feel like they are when they're not looking at traditional cultures or even religious practices associated with the religious, we don't have to accept it for the religious reason. We can accept it for a different reason. I feel like in, a, in abandoning all of that or refusing to take a good look at it, they were abandoning a huge and important source of knowledge. And as you said, social technology. So yeah, well, and I'll, <laughs> I'll elevate a, well, a misconception here, but I think a misconception that also delineates probably where some of the negative parenting practices come from. So if you're talking about the rationalist community as 99% atheist, they just don't primarily identify as atheist. And one thing that we often elevate on this show is that when a community identifies in a specific way, status hierarchies within that community can often begin to form with how far you other yourself along the metric of identification within the community. So an example here would be if I'm a goth and I meet another goth, how much that person has othered themselves from mainstream society, whether it's through piercings or fashion mods or a weird way of dressing, that is my immediate assumption of their goth status. And so when a community has identified primarily, primary mechanism of identification is atheist, you get uh, how do you be more atheist than other people can become a bit of a part of the status hierarchy, which can make it really hard to pull from these older social technologies. Oh, but I also think that a big problem with people looking at older social technologies and traditionalism, like you say, is they often look at, well, oh, so the, the traditionalism equals female disempowerment or social isolation. And they often do, but I think that often people look at the worst vices or the worst aspects of these traditional cultures and think of those as the defining aspects of those cultures. When really, what we talk about a lot in the book that Malcolm wrote, The Pragmatist Guide to Crafting Religion, is that really the key is it has to be a hard culture. And by hard, we mean a culture where you make serious sacrifices, you other yourself to a certain extent, like you look funny or you dress funny, you have a weird name, you live differently, and you really lean into and invest in, in that tradition and religion in a way that leads to benefits. Well, so for example, many- by that is It's hard to adopt a sense of identity if you're not making those kinds of daily sacrifices mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. a community. And many of those um, sacrifices also are the things that do impart strength. So while female disempowerment does not impart strength as far as I'm concerned, things like fast do because they help you develop stronger inhibitory controls mm -hmm. and that's hard people don't like fasting or giving things up it's pretty freaking difficult well, or, I, or I, I, like would even, I might even push back in the female disempowerment thing because i think mm -hmm. there's push and pulls with all the different choices that we make in terms of okay we're going to allow more for something here there is sometimes there is a loss on the other side it's not visible entirely but i think that all the ways in which we have allowed women especially young women greater autonomy and control over their life choices, there has been a negative consequence for those same women, I think, when they become mothers, because it's the same forces that give you more autonomy as an individual, weaken the social ties that are very, they're important for families and for mothers. Yeah. yeah. Or when I, they try to get married, for example, if you yeah, have a super sexually partners, free youth and then you try to get married, it's hard. Yeah. Or a society with equal wages being harder for women to get partners if they always want a partner who's earning more than them. Or, I mean, there's, there's so many ways that I think that there, I wish that there was a more open discussion about some of these things, but it, it is hard to do. So I think, I, and I definitely agree with you in terms of hierarchies within communities. This is why I, when I said rationalist, I wasn't even sure, do I want to be a part of a community where everybody considers them some, themselves a rationalist? Because yes, I found like it, within those communities, I think the ra rationalists really enjoy contradicting each other in the hell of a way. <laughs> they absolutely so. do. I've written long things about how that community, it fell apart because it was a community where status hierarchy was determined by knowledge, like scientifically backed knowledge. The problem is, is that if you try to front with a scientific study that everyone knows, then that actually hurts your position because it shows that you thought that something that was commonly known was not commonly known. Yeah. So you can only really front with either 
uh, scientific studies that go against what anyone would think is true or scientific studies that are fringe or rare findings, yeah. which led to the communities becoming what I call as a slur for them, butter eaters, um, because they have these things where they eat full sticks of butter every day uh, because there was like one study that said it was a good idea. And, well, and, and because it was an obscure study, they looked good or like extra special for doing the weird thing, the obscure thing that people didn't know yeah. about. I, mean, I didn't I was, believe it, it discourages it following anything. actually it does it, it, that's a community that discourages fo fo true followers which you do need you know, yes, in a healthy yes. community actually but but then this becomes a thing if we're restructuring culture right we've got to think about how do we prevent these sort of downstream effects that are easy to miss you say something like i i often think of culture crafting as being like a monkey's paw like you don't if you're not really careful in how you word things, like I want rationalism, and it's like define rationalism. And they're like scientific studies. And then the monkey's paw does its horrible rish. Or I want atheism. And it's like, okay, how do you define atheism? Lack of old traditions. And then the monkey paw does its horrible wish. And so it's, if you're building something, especially for your kids, for your family, you've got to think. So I would love to ask you three questions I want to go through. One has almost become like a mainstay on this show that I, I think will make a mainstay on the show every time we have somebody who's deconverted from a religious tradition. What did you like about your birth religious tradition? What social technologies do you think Islam does well? Or And before we go further, it's useful if you talk about the branch of Islamic culture you came from, because one of the things we're always talking about on this podcast is, is one, the difference in Muslim and Western marriage strategies. One of the ones that we say is very interesting is Andrew Tate has taken like some Muslim strategies around marriage structure and tried to almost sort of secularize it into a new family structure. And I'm like, that's interesting, but I don't know if that's something that Western men should be emulating. Mm -hmm. But anyway, yeah. So I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on like, what do you think Islam gets right? Especially that you think Western culture doesn't. Okay. So let me start from the first question, which was how did I grow up? I I was raised Shia Muslim, which is like a minority, but it's the Iran people in Iraq. But I was schooled in the Sunni like tradition because that was the local community where I grew up. <laughs> so that's where I was going to Sunday school. And that's those are the like religious like competitions I was involved in. So it was it, it, in my mind, actually, the two traditions are very um mixed up i'm actually confused and it, it's only because i've been doing this kind of activism for a long time and this topic has come up that it has I, i've been able to pull them apart in my mind i it's but it's like saying that i was catholic and also protestant from evangelical on one yeah. part side of my family and catholic from my mom's side but i think there's a lot that i like about islam and there's a lot that I think is unique and interesting. So I, it's actually not a hard question for me to answer at all. It's just that I think that on the whole, it is like deeply harmful. So it, 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 I don't have any trouble talking about all the things that are great about it. But I think that what's fundamental to understand is that the internal logic of Islam is so alien. I, I think it's so different. It's not, I didn't even appreciate how different, like how fundamentally different of a, social structure it is until Please explain. Like, like now I, I couldn't possibly i couldn't i'm not actually <laughs> we don't have the we don't have the time we don't have the uh, i don't have the intelligence but i think that it's just something I've, i'm coming to fully understand if, if anybody wants to read up on this ernest gellner is a scholar that i would recommend he is so interesting but he wrote several books that are he, he also he wrote about like philosophy, words, linguistics, but also Muslim society and civil society in particular. What mm. are the kinds of conditions that foster a healthy civil society? So he took a look at Muslim societies, Asian societies, and the West and compared oh. the ways that they structured power and the kinds of conditions that that brewed. So, it, very any, eye-opening. Anything very you remember from this? Just yes. any specifics? <laughs> what, you're, you're what, what, putting me on the spot. I, I think... <sighs> I don't know. I don't know. I would have to prep. I would have to because there were so okay, many okay, 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 ideas okay. We'll, about it. Um, we'll keep going. Well, so yeah, what yeah, yeah. what other specific things would you borrow from Islam for your kids? Well, mm -hmm. yeah. Back to that question as to what was what's good about it. Um, one of the things I always liked about Islam is the way that it encouraged charitability amongst mm -hmm. other Muslims. So there's a requirement to give a certain percentage of your income to the ummah, the community, the poor, really, in the community. And, um, and that, is that through any religious organization or just directly to? Is it direct giving or through an organization? 
I think it could be, I, I don't know if it's specified, but it could be anything. It could be direct hitting. You can. Oh, cool. you, you look at the words of the text because I was looking at this. It is implied it's direct giving. Nice. I, I'm sure some people have, or any tradition is going to over time have a lot of branches which end up hijacking this. Mm -hmm. um, but it is actually pretty unique in that you do not get this in most Christian traditions where the expectation is that it goes to the church. through church infrastructure yeah. before reaching the poor, which is interesting. Yeah. But continue. Yeah, so I, I like that about it. I like that it was an expectation, almost like a tax. But it, it, Islam thinks of itself as very much a state religion and it, not not even something that you can pull apart and say, this is the state and this is the church. I think even that conception it oh. reveals a kind of Western approach to politics and religion. And it, so that I, that whole infrastructure is not something I support. Um, but, but it is worth, worth elevating this concept because it's one that I would definitely talk about when you're trying to understand Islam as different from the other major religious traditions. Whereas I think Judaism is also pretty unique in this regard in that mm -hmm. Judaism is really structured to be an ethno group slash state slash religion. And Ain't necessarily it, ethno group, yes. But would you say state? In so it depends on the period of Jewish history. If we're talking especially about a second temple period Judaism, it was structured ground up to be a state system. Mm -hmm. And what happened to Judaism was how a culture evolves when a, a religious system that is really meant to be operating a state no longer has a state to operate. Mm -hmm. That's why the destruction of the second temple was so existential for the Jewish people. Right. And every Exodus period was so existential for the Jewish people. And then it has obviously heavily modified itself since that period. But I think it's re-pulling on now with, with the state of Israel. It's restructuring itself in that older fashion. With Islam, as you pointed out, but it, it is worth elevating here, is it is a religion that is designed to be the state religion. And it doesn't function as effectively when it is not the state religion. And when it is not the state religion, it's always searching to become uh, eventually a state religion, which can have positive and negative consequences, depending on the side. You might think only negative consequences, but I think it's just it, as somebody who grew up now, I, I was yeah. raised primarily in the, I was born, actually, I was born in Pakistan. And I remember coming here, but I was quite young, still seven. But a, as being raised in that religion that has all these instincts of a majority religion, that's the instinct mm -hmm. of Islam. And that is part and parcel of even some of the celebrations like Eid is supposed to be this public thing that you all do together. The whole mm -hmm. community is involved and it is happening publicly. And for Eid to be something like in the West where it's very private now, it's like you visit, you go visit somebody's house and then you take a drive and you visit somebody else's house. In Pakistan, it's in the streets and in, and Bakr Eid, which is the one where they sacrifice the animals, that's happening on the streets everywhere. It's a very public skeptic, a spectacle. And that's part of it. Par part of the thing, the celebration that this is public. To be driven into kind of a private, the private sphere, I don't think Islam really thrives. And that's mm -hmm. part of the reason I think diaspora communities that are Muslim feel a sense of like disorientation because I, I think that they're the, the instincts of the religious tradition that they have been brought up in do not fully and easily comport to being a minority in a you know a country that has very different majority majority values and traditions. Judaism, I think it's it, they don't struggle in the same way. I think that yeah. just because their history has for for so long been in that position, I think they tend to take it a little bit more. I, yeah. I, they thrive, actually. I think they, they thrive yeah. in, this in that environment. Yeah, and, and, and now they do. They thrive as, as subcultural groups with separated, often, like, legal systems and stuff like that, which is but really interesting. It's so interesting, the idea of a religion and, and culture that's optimized on a societal level rather than on an individual level, because I'm so used to growing up with the extreme opposite end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Not that I was, my parents were, they called themselves born-again Buddhist. I, really, they were, like, the most non-religious people in the entire world but they came from basically a calvinist kind of background a protestant background which is mm -hmm. just it's so individualistic that of course they would end up calling themselves born again buddhists after a certain number of generations like yeah. and just doing their own thing and their metaphysical beliefs were like a mixture of inspired by scientology and other science fiction books and buddhism and like whatever they saw on tv recently and that that was all just so on the local level. Whereas here you're looking with Islam at holidays, they don't really make sense if it's not literally on a community, not, not just like a block party, but like the entire city. Well, 
And that makes it really hard, I think, for you to try to replicate some of those things that worked well for your own kids because <laughs> they're not going to have that community. Did you find the most utility in? Yeah. Sorry, repeat that first bit. Which holidays did you find the most utility in? If you were going to practice them for your kids and you could have them practice at a society-wide level, which ones would you be like, this protects a good value or is a useful social technology? I wouldn't do any of the Muslim ones. I wouldn't. I like Christmas. So I think that, Christmas is that, freaking awesome. that, that is what I would do. There's only two in Islam. Mm -hmm. And one is from a kid's perspective. I didn't think either was spectacularly interesting unless you went outside and then you kind of had a blast. <laughs> yeah. The one where you kill all the animals, that one was actually traumatizing. I remember I, when it was, when I was young, I was taken to a, a, a slaughter Oh boy. Um, of a cow and I saw it happen and I remember the blood I can't forget and I don't even have a fantastic memory but I remember everything <sighs> uh, about that I remember the like the butcher's son playing in the blood because he, he was just like for him it was just whatever yeah, huh? was like, like I'm just like having a, a good Tuesday. time yeah yes and I was just like dad I want to go home I need to go home I remember just all these animals on the street it was not Maybe it's something you come around to as you grow, if you grow up in it and then you're an adult and then you have all these great memories associated with it. But just as a child, it wasn't, it wasn't my, it, okay. What's the other one? The other one is it's like Christmas, but you get money at the end of it. Oh, money. Like, you just get money. You get money instead of presents, you get money. But I like presents better because I think it's, it's personal. Like I, I, I like that somebody's thinking of me rather than just handing me a twenty dollar bill. And for well, kids, I mean, it's it's. Um, oh, you would probably like our religion. We we'll have to have a separate conversation about that at some point. But I think that's better for her podcast. But I, I was going to say, yeah. this Christmas, it's a great thing because it's like uh, people are always telling us, oh, a constructed religion that's meant just for the best interest of your kids with unique holidays that would never catch on. And I'm like, <laughs> Christmas and Santa Claus. What are you talking about? Yeah. Obviously. This stuff can catch on yeah but, but christmas is also one of those holidays that works when it's done publicly when it's a yeah. season when it's the colors yeah. and it's the warmth and everyone's making those cookies and the, you have the smells that are you associated with Chris, christmas although our kids talk about the future police which is like the santa of our weird holiday our flagship holiday more than they talk about Santa okay. for sure. Yeah, we've had like, more success with our holiday than Santa. They proselytize our religion more than we do. Like they'll uh, babysitter will come over and they'll be like, "The future police got this for me because I did this," and like the future police might do this or that. And they keep and our, our babysitters are giving us the side eye, and we're like, "It's a thing." I don't know. derailed it, Simone. To not yeah. derail this. Another question I wanted to ask, which is one, or I've actually wanted to talk to a Muslim scholar about this. Uh, I'm the wrong person scholar. then for it. I can tell yeah, you that you're right probably now, but... the wrong person, but you might be just the right person because you have lived in both cultures and you're from outside the community is i have never fully gotten the animosity affiliated with the sunni shia split mm -hmm. when i look at something like the catholic protestant split for example i can understand why there's animosity there's two completely different systems for how to determine what's true when i look at splits within jewish communities i can understand where that animosity comes from but the sunni shia split doesn't seem to be a theological split it seems to be a purely governance system split and mm -hmm. so my thesis is that the, and you can tell me if I'm wrong about this, is the animosity is actually because Islam is designed to be a state system. So the yeah, governance yeah. split matters so much more than it would in another religion. Yeah. Yep. yep. Is that it? it is. Yeah. The oh. politics can't be separated and it, it was a political difference and it, it was a meaningful political difference. And the two yep. sects are, they do practice differently. Hmm. And I mean, it, it differs a little bit from country to country. Like I, I was talking to this ex Shia from ex Muslim from Saudi who was Shia but and her experience with Shiism is not mine my my experience with Shiism was as a minority religion within a uh, majority Sunni uh, population that's how Shiism has developed as well actually so there's like layers to all of this but I get getting back a little bit to the local and individualistic aspect of Christianity I think that's key to it, it's key to how well it has functioned in this specific modern liberal kind of con societal context mm -hmm. and why it has just worked in tandem with developing so many interesting and innovative like not just technologies but social systems and ideologies and ways of thinking about the world I think that has been it, it is key and without it you end up in a completely different space but I, I will add that it's not the case that Islam is just like centrally controlled. It's actually not really centrally controlled at all. Yet there is this high culture, like this high Islam that matters. There are folk traditions, but those tend to be the 
the, the, the remnants of whatever that that region used to believe in before it was conquered yeah. by Muslim army. So that those sort of for, folk religion of Bangladesh looks very different than the folk religion of Turkey. Having said that, I feel as if that those are disappearing. And mm -hmm. that's, that is what you would expect over time as literacy increases everywhere. And then you're able to look at the book and determine that, okay, this is the or originalist interpretation of Islam is actually the true one. What mm -hmm. I've been practicing or what my grandmother has tattoos on her face, I didn't know that was not acceptable. I didn't know that was a local Tunisian tradition. Yeah. And in fact, it's not Islamic at all. And I have to get rid of it. So there is a kind of a, a coming together, flattening almost of Islam as it looks and as is practiced worldwide, which is a little troubling and a little sad, I think. Yeah, I definitely say that's bad, losing that that cultural diversity. I, I Okay, so another question I have for you, because you're talking about like the Christian system, which I will admit has led to a tremendous amount of, of technological and economic growth, but there was a period um, where a form of Islam caused one of the greatest technological leaps in human history during the Islamic golden age. Do you think that was, so a lot of people will say uh, that was just serendipity. Like the libraries were destroyed. The area became less economically powerful. And that's why, do you think that's why, or do you think that there was a shift in the theology of Islam that made it harder for modern Islam to match the technological greatness of its ancestors or a shift in underlying technological trends? I think there's a lot of historical reasons that are just like, that is how it played out. And that is why it happened. And I, it is also the case that the, this is the benefit of having kind of a, a religion in which the political rulers do have spiritual power and spiritual leadership positions, because if they happen to be liberal and if they happen to be tolerant and interested in you know technology yeah. and innovation, which is what that is what I would put as the, the, the central factor in why the golden age looks so different than other times. However, I'm not prepared to- I'll give you my give you, I have a yeah. thesis on this and you can tell me if it sounds wrong to you or right. So I think there were two key factors. One is I think that Islam pushes a drive towards a form of academic study of stuff like math as a way of understanding God. And so long as math and chemistry didn't directly contradict Islamic scripture, it could be seen as a theological pursuit. And that is why during the period where before technology got so hard that it started contradicting scripture, it, it really synergized very well. Isn't it? Isn't the, but, but that was the Catholic church. Oh, the Catholic church never did expect... math like Muslims. I mean, it, like, you no, but I mean, like, in the sense that that's how they approached the study of the natural world as a study of God, because you were studying his creation. So it was all yeah. part and parcel of the same thing. It, the, the, this science as yeah, something you're probably right. That's a good point. You've got all the like Gregor Mendel and everything like that and all the study out of the monasteries. So yeah, that it's basically it brings you closer to God until it doesn't and then it's not okay. Then then the secondary thesis that I had, which could also be wrong, but it's one that informs my thinking a lot, is it was the spread of Sufism that ended up collapsing the culture among the elite circles that allowed them to look for hmm. sources of knowledge <laughs> in what we would argue is corrupted mental states, i.e. emotions and visions are a better source of truth than study of the natural world. But you could say maybe that's wrong too. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know about that. I would have to give that one a little bit of thought. I'm not automatically dismissing it in the way, okay. that, might, in the, in the, way the first theory makes me think. But I, but I, I, do, I do think it's worse studying these things. If a culture was productive at one time and not productive at another time, and you can isolate what elements changed, then I can know what elements are useful to build into my own family's culture. Mm, good mm -hmm. point. Because, in a world where fertility is collapsing, we, those of us with high fertility, could end up having a disproportionate play in the future. Right. Um, so know, let me, I think that at, at least in modern times, this is not a deeper going back to the core of what Islam might be a point, but I think that it, what it is in the modern world, at least the example of the West definitely played a part in how Muslims viewed science and technology in general, because they were able to look across the pond and see where science took all these guys who thought that they were going closer to God, but now we know that they aren't closer. Yeah. To God, and how did that know? go? Yeah. And yeah. So there's that example that they can always point to and they can say, no, they looked at, they approached the world in this 
fashion, they abandoned mm -hmm. Revelation and instead right, started using their reason to make out all kinds of things. And now they have strip clubs. Right. And so this is, it was just this explicit example of, you don't really have to think through it. You don't really have to, you, you just see it play out. And I think that that has a huge impact on how Muslims think of even modernity, right? Like it, it, modernity is a bad word. Capitalism, like all this consumerism, like that all just goes together really. But it, 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 in the Muslim world, they really do. Modernity really is atheism. And they're not if you're, if you're looking at it from the perspective of evolved cultural traits designed to increase fertility rate of cultural members it is a successful mimetic package oh, sure. yeah um, but to be to be good enough to be to reproduce on a societal level in long periods of time i hey i could could never disagree and i think the apostasy taboo really does help there you easy in mm -hmm. it, Easy end, but it really difficult to get out, even yeah. if you want it. So there, there, there's lots that Islam and and the taboos and the traditions. Like there's so many ways in which it really is a it's a great mean if just living, just surviving, is your most important. It, it's the thing that you are focusing on. However, I I would also add that I don't know if what has worked for the Muslim world up until now will survive our most recent leap. I don't think that we, we talk about all these things with social media is creating social I, alienation and isolation. But if you look at the research for in, in Muslim like places where you think they would have a healthy sense of community. In fact, the same kind of erosions are happening, but they also don't have running water. So like the, it's the combination of two horrible things that are coming together. I am not sure it might be, they might be finding a way through it with their strong social networks. I think that maybe they won't like maybe they'll get the wrong end of the sticks in both ways or I'm, at least i'm concerned about that in any case no no i think you're absolutely right and this is something we regularly see like you're studying fertility collapse generally cultures that have had some cultural hack that has acted as a bulwark to fertility collapse when the dam breaks it breaks very fast and all at once but then of course that leads to downstream especially negative consequences because within for example these already conservative muslim cultures if everyone who is open to using a cell phone is medically sterilized that means only the most extremist iterations are going to get through as we call it in, because we do some like pseudo-religious stuff, we say you've got to walk through the Valley of the Lotus Eaters. That's what our civilization is doing right now. I mean, I, 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 that is so much harder to do given the way that they're, uh, given their level of development. It is actually, it's easier to procure a smartphone than it is to have a laptop or a computer. So they're, yeah. they're, they're, from a literal functioning perspective, cell phones have become a really important part of the way that their world works. I would say we're just used to them for a longer period of time but i actually think because we have the our foundations are quite strong our institutions are quite strong we can get away from technology and survive um in a way that is becoming increasingly harder for them to do because they're in this crucial like mid like bizarre stage of development yeah. and, and so that's just something that it, it's something to think about and i think that th the way that cell phones in particular smartphones in particular and the and the, their connectivity to the internet, the way that has pierced through the social fabric, because you have, okay, you have these, you have societies, you have a lot of like this meta control over people and what they're thinking and what they're thinking truly, because you're talking mm -hmm. to each other and all of that is very control and bounded. But now here's this escape hatch. I have a lot of social controls here. I think the world does this and this is how it works. And this is what truth is. But now I have something in my pocket where in in which once i join that place i can be as individualistic as any american and i can access all of that information that they have i can see what they're doing and it will impact my brain too so that yeah. social the, the, the social control that you have just it's hard to maintain in that kind of environment if they're watching a lot of porn there too right and they're virgins they're yeah until well, and, and a lot of people are aware of how significantly muslim fertility rates have fallen 
in, mm-hmm. in, in even non-wealthy Muslim countries. It has been. Yeah, and, and when you think yeah. about the fact that they don't have regular access to birth control in the same way that we do, that yeah. is, it's, it's also, it's more striking when you think about it. Yeah. Those- and as we always point out on the show, is one path that some groups will take to get through the Valley of the Lotus Eaters is blinding themselves. By that, what I mean is completely like we will kill our kid if we catch them with a cell phone. And you're going to find this in some communities, but if you blind yourself to get through at the other end, if you're then coming out and telling everyone else you're going to kill them and they have to follow your system, you're still blind, okay? And they have automated kill drones. You don't have the same amount of cultural power that you would have if you got through using power of will that was reinforced culturally. And so the question is, how do you do this? I can give you an answer. It sounds like Simone really wanted to tell you about our, our future holidays. So why don't you do that and get her reaction to it? We The very gist of our attempt at this is we practice descendant worship. So we tell our children that essentially our God, our family's God, is their descendants thousands, millions of years in the future, who plausibly even have the ability to travel through time and intervene to create the future that should come. Because mm-hmm. we also have this sort of weird deterministic, but you still have free will view of how the world works, very mechanical. Um, and so for future day, for example, we steal toys, a future police steal through us, of course, a toys or things from their lives that cause bad behaviors, addictive devices, games, things like that, iPads, whatever. Last year, we just took all their toys. We just, yeah, all their toys disappeared because we're like, oh, let's, <laughs> let's make this really dramatic. And then, but they loved it because in their place, we left like sort of scorch marks with a bunch of different things and like weird future like evidence. And, and they're like, oh, what happened? And then they have to make a pledge in this family book that we're using as a time capsule slash heirloom to how they're going to make the world a better place and how they're going to become a better person for that year and for the long-term future. Upon making that pledge, of course, then the future police will see it and receive it. They receive their toys back plus some additional toys. And if they achieve those things that they committed to, at some point in this year, they'll get an even bigger gift as a reward. So there are gifts involved. There's there's photo opportunities involved. And the kids just freaking love it. And we started to, though this wasn't part of the plan for the holiday, is throughout the year, as they are moving closer to their goals, they do get not just like one future police gift, but like a couple things. Because their goals weren't like, oh, I'm going to start a business or I'm going to graduate high school or I'm going to ace algebra the oldest but, four, so not exactly cognitive processing of a yeah kid. they're very young so it's more like i'm not gonna i'm gonna be nice to my brother kind of stuff so like they are getting things from the future police as reinforcement and they just freak they love it and they, they know that the future police are watching so it's affecting their behavior but it's also a fun cute thing uh-huh. but the and, idea here yeah. was this in most of our holidays is we had a specific value we wanted to convey the idea of having agency over the future and, and long-termism long-term yeah yeah okay uh, so I think that's great and remarkable and very inventive of you. (laughs) I've been thinking myself about what to do and what to adopt and how lazy to be in that respect. In terms of creating your own thing, though, do you think about there's the one, the problem of like, does this take away the magic when it is so articulated also on your end? Like you're like, you're telling them the purpose of the thing that they're doing in a kind of in an explicit way that people don't people normally don't and it, do you think that will take away from the experience or make it less effective or anything no. or just no no okay. i can explain why so even within the theology of the future police they are to a child right in the same way that like god changes the conception people have of god when they're young it's like zeus it's like a guy in the clouds and when they're older they're like oh it's like some incorporeal we would say they're changing like small probabilistic quantum fluctuations which have a butterfly effect which would change larger behavior and if they were going to create this holiday and convince us to do it, they would have had it appear in a way where we thought it was our idea and we were doing it for their best interest. So in a way, unlike Santa Claus or something like that, even to an adult, the future police really plausibly did create the holiday and really are gifting them things. We were being manipulated all along. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. That's (laughs) <laughs> um, do you think it do you need converts now though because it's a no. it's not going to be a community thing though exactly like, and the, so but the thing that... is it doesn't need converts but what we really what we I want fight converts for, I'll, I'll i'll take those <laughs> take them what we uh, really want to fight for and why we were so excited to see your tweet and this brings it all back which is good because the kids just got back home from a park malcolm and they're yeah. about to storm the castle it's okay it's um okay. But so what we really want people to do is what you're doing, which is I want to culturally innovate from 
a very thoughtful perspective and maybe it's a little religious and maybe it's not a little religious, it's whatever. And we want as many people to take a whack at this as possible mm -hmm. because there will always be people who choose to go with the traditional religion. Like that is being tried. So it's not an experiment that I'm concerned about. What I'd love to see more of is essentially that startup seed investment where 99% mm -hmm. are going to fail. That's fine but a couple are gonna become unicorns and become additional viable religious traditions that may create additional thriving alternatives to mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. Because we need thriving alternative religions that can make sense in a post-globalization, post-internet, post-smartphone world. Mm -hmm. And so I'm happier yeah. if someone yeah, right. chooses to well, do their own thing. Like so what you're so doing. we should elevate the larger theological structure of this system is if God is communicating with us through which cultural systems succeed and don't succeed, then he can only talk if there is a diversity of cultural systems to compete against each other. So this is the theological framing to it. The logical framing to it is to say, if we're entering this period of mass cultural die-off, we're going to need as large a diversity of people to make it through the Valley of the Lotus Eaters unblinded for human civilization to survive survive and not become some sort of like large fast fascist monoculture. And right. so the more cultural experimentation we have, the better off we're going to be because the more robust our species is going to be on the other side of this, where robustness is correlated with a diverse group of cultural systems surviving to the end of it. They would not, might not be necessarily diverse by the end of it. Like it might be that, that there's one, it, it took a long time for religious systems to, to get to where they are and to be it's as robust true. as they are and they're still not that robust. It's so true. if we're just inventing them on the fly or like trying to reason our way into them, which is I think, I, I wonder about that as a method regardless which is crazy to say as somebody who's, this is all I have. This is what I, this is the thing that I, if, I, I don't even know how else to go about in the world, but it, a certain amount of serendipity and just like chance encounters formed some of the experimentations. Cause I think that might've been like throughout history, because I think they, the reason would have rejected them. Reason might've said, this is never going to work. This is not, we shouldn't do this. But for whatever reason, it just so happened that they did it and they tried it and it worked. I think a lot so. of it's right time, right place. Jesus was not the first apocalyptic Jew, right? right, right. Because sometimes it clicks. And right then, time, right place. And yeah. there's an underlying logic that you didn't understand right at the moment, but it worked. And so you keep exactly. doing it. So that's, I, I think it's, um, in, that's interesting. Yeah. And I, mm -hmm. I, I actually, in, we need so much more diversity than is maybe possible, but. We'll fight for it that, anyway. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> you know, we'll have to we'll have to brainstorm more about this. But I yeah, anyway, I'm so glad you're thinking about these things. You, we're you're taking such a thoughtful approach. And I'm in a boring I'm in DC, which is boring. I was just talking to you you're know, not far from us. Yeah, oh, you're pretty really? close. Where, where are you guys? We're in Pennsylvania. Okay. Well, we'll have to stop by and say hello at some sure, point. For sure. If you're ever yeah. near nearby, let me know. <laughs> yeah. I was actually thinking I need to be in like California or New York in order no. to meet like minded people, but maybe not. Okay. Not at all. No. All right. You're in a really good, like in the, actually some of the most thoughtful parents, like from a cultural standpoint that we know are in DC. Oh, okay. um, yeah. So okay. you're in a very good zone and right. uh, yeah, but okay. So everyone check out Sarah Hader's work. It's just like basically everything I've encountered that you've written or done in terms of like podcasting has been fantastic. So Sarah, the hater on Twitter and check out Sarah Hader on Substack as well. Thank you so much for coming on and Thank we'd have to have you back you at some this point. Was so really fun. Fun. This was great. Thank you. Thank you. Do you guys have guests often? Yeah. yeah. On this podcast? Yeah. That sometimes... often. But it's harder to keep good consistency when you're doing guests, okay. as, yeah. as you probably know. Okay. Because yeah. sometimes but you're super boring. fun. You're super fun and, and super cool. So we, we just don't post them then. Great. <laughs> when we don't post them, it's typically because the people have never been on podcasts before and they like answer questions with yes or no. <laughs> it's not great. That's not it. You're just hedging in mm -hmm. case she's mm -hmm. boring. No, you're yeah. not going to be so boring. Nice, Simone. You're not going to be boring. I love, I'm, I, I'm the, hoping the, that, yeah. It, it's going to be good. I'm excited. Okay. Um, Indy's being pretty good today, so I'm not worried. It's good that I'm feeding her, though. But look, I mean, look, so the doors behind you, they're pretty thick. If we just shoved two bookshelves in there that are suspended from, it's like a, a barn door where there's an overhead suspension. So there are two suspended bookshelves and like they can part to create a small doorway. And they're probably too much of a hassle, but. Where are we to go? You said right. Between the playroom and the bunk bedroom in the, the thick double door area behind oh. you. Yeah. Oh, you mean 
Oh, what, a secret bookshelf? Yeah, like a bookshelf that then opens into a door. Or oh, so you make that whole wall there a bookshelf. A bookshelf. Uh-huh. Oh. A suspended yeah. bookshelf. Could be pretty cool. Someday. Secret bookshelf. I don't know. It would take up room. It would. Honestly, your house is so perfect. What are we going to do with it? Like you said, like some kind of dumb lands, I could do that, Simone. At Fatlands, yeah. I, but Fatlands probably already has one. But whatever, it's sold, Malcolm. It's sold. And we can sold. buy it. We can storm it. No. That's why we have guns. I don't want fat. I'm not vacuuming Fatlands, okay? I'm not cleaning those floors. I'm not doing it. Can't. Too That'd much. be such when, a nightmare to vacuum. Yeah. Can you imagine cleaning all of those toilets, vacuuming all those floors, heating all those rooms? At least that one haunted house that we looked at, the one that was like super creepy that had like a super old house attached to it. At least you could just cordon that off and be afraid of all the ghosts. That's <laughs> what they did. How's this? Is this better? 